Hello and welcome. As we all know, the world has been transformed by the pandemic. Our, our education system, the, the gaps between rich and poor, our belief in a functioning society, all of these have been impacted by the events of the past year. And, and this is particularly true for young people who have experienced stresses like never before. But although stress is difficult, it's also where historically we've tended to learn our biggest and most valuable lessons. And so today, with the help from experts, we're going to talk about the solutions that this period has revealed and your stories that show how we're coming through the pandemic stronger than before. My name is Charles Duhigg, and this is Moonshot Platform. Today, we're going to talk about two important topics, and, and we really want this to be a conversation, a dialogue between you who are watching and all of us who get to participate. And the topics we're going to be talking about is access to quality education and the advancement of youth mental health. The, everyone who's participating in this plays an important role in what's next, because we want you to ask the difficult questions, to express your opinions in live polling sessions, to comment, and most importantly, to become part of the solution by clicking Become a Moonshotter button on our webpage. So you can help support one of the educational projects or in, innovative advocates who are advancing U.S. education that you'll learn about today. But before I introduce today's speakers, I'd like to welcome the founder of the Moonshot Platform, multidisciplinary creator and artist, Yemi A.D. Hey, my Moonshotters. It's great to get together again after almost a year of probably the craziest times we have experienced in our lifetime. The Moonshot Platform was born from the idea that we can get things done more efficiently when we are sharing ideas and working together rather than competing to find solutions to the world's most pressing issues. In my life, I've been fortunate to have worked with inspiring leaders in the arts, technology, business, political and scientific communities, and have seen firsthand the benefits of bringing together diverse experiences and perspectives. This is why we have brought you here today. Whether it was our first Moonshot conference with Madeleine Albright about racial inequalities in reaction to social unrest following the killing of George Floyd, or our second conference in Europe about the future of education following the closure of schools due to pandemic, and now today's where we will explore topics of mental health and access to education in the US, we worked around the clock to address the most pressing issues of these times. The pandemic has shown us the critical need to find the most exceptional thought leaders, founders, teachers, all of the change makers who need our attention and support as they work every day on their Moonshot ideas and solutions. To date, partners of Moonshot Platform pledged $23 million, accelerating impact in education and decreasing inequalities. We have been joined by 3,000 Moonshotters from both continents, reached over 1 million viewers, and have gotten over 100 submissions from game-changing founders. And some of their projects are waiting for your support today in the Moonshot Impact Gallery, a place where you can discover organizations that are dedicated to making a difference in the world. The Moonshot platform is here to connect impact hackers with other change makers to provide actionable and scalable solutions to some of the most complex problems that we face as society. Thank you for joining this effort and let's get to work. So Yemi is beaming in from outer space. If you looked in the background, I think you could actually see Jeff Bezos behind him someplace. The, the rest of us are all over the country and including you who are all over the US and some even abroad. And what brings together all of our guests is the, that they're united by the work they've done to improve lives in their communities and across the nation. And so I wanna kick things off by asking each of them to answer a question in 30 seconds, which is, what do you think is the biggest problem regarding access to quality education? And what's a scalable solution to tackle it? And we're going to put a little timer up on the screen so that you'll know when your time is up. But in 30 seconds, if you don't mind telling us the answer to that, and let's start, if you don't mind, with Dr. Janice Jackson, who's the former CEO of the Chicago Public Schools, which is the third largest school district in the U.S., and a senior fellow at the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching. Dr. Jackson? What do you think is the biggest problem? 
I think the biggest issue facing America is access to high quality curriculum. Um, this was illuminated during the pandemic as we opened our classrooms up in homes all across the country. And we know that there are huge disparities in what students are expected to know and do even within the same district and in various schools. The solution I think is to leverage technology and provide every teacher with access to grade level appropriate curriculum and materials. Skyline, which is CPS's first ever fully aligned curriculum, seeks to do that and level the playing field by providing our teachers with um, culturally relevant curriculum. We believe this move is going to revolutionize education in Chicago and ensure that all of our students have access to college-ready ready, uh, curriculum. That's fascinating. And I look forward to hearing more about that because I want to hear what you guys have done in Chicago. But let me let me move to, to Art Rolnick, who's a senior fellow at the University of Minnesota and a former senior vice president at the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis and a researcher on child development and social policy. It, it, Art, what do you think is the biggest issue that we're confronting right now? The biggest problem, the biggest issue, I believe, is the achievement gap. Children living in poverty are much less likely than other children to succeed in school and hence less likely to have healthy and prosperous lives. And we know this gap begins well before kindergarten. Indeed, it begins at birth. A science based, the solution, a science-based program, which we call the Minnesota Model for Early Childhood Education. We empower low-income parents by awarding them with an early learning scholarship to access high-quality programs of their choice, plus a parent mentor who joins the family as early as prenatal. So we do not just close the achievement gap, we prevent it. I'm looking forward to hearing more about the Minnesota model because I know that you guys have had enormous impact with that. L let me turn now to Nina Reese, who's a former deputy undersecretary for innovation improvement at the U.S. Department of Education and now is the president and chief executive officer of the National Alliance for Public Charter Schools, which is the leading national nonprofit organization committed to the charter school movement. Nina, what do you think is the biggest problem? Thank you so much for having me. Um, I would say the greatest problem in this country is the way our school system assigns students uh, to a school based on their zip code. Uh, if you happen to be a student of limited means, uh, you, ha you also are probably attending a school uh, in a neighborhood that um, is poor. Uh, and the achievement of these schools, unfortunately, has been subpar for years um, in terms of graduation rates and in terms of college acceptance rates. Uh, the way to break uh, this cycle hasn't been simply through money, effort, and time. Uh, I think what we need to do is something far more transformational that gives more power to the teachers in those schools uh, to educate in different ways, expand the school year and the school, uh, school day and school year, uh, but also to make sure parents have greater choices to attend schools uh, outside of the zip code in which they reside. That makes a lot of sense. This is all such great stuff. I'm actually taking notes as you guys are speaking. Um, Ed Gowson, let me, let me ask you what you think the biggest problem is. You're the co-founder and chief executive officer of Mantra Health, which is a New York-based digital mental health company. Yeah, thank you, Charles. Uh, from my perspective, there are many large issues contributing to the lack of access to quality education around the world. Um, for, for me, the most interesting one, in my view, uh, and it's very much the same issue we're seeing in mental health care, is the scarcity uh, of teacher and the status quo around relying on uh, people to provide education, uh, simply. And uh, I think that artificial intelligence um, and interactive content uh, of quality, coupled with rethinking uh, of the labor force needed to support uh, child or adolescence education, uh, has tremendous uh, potential to solve uh, this issue globally. And I know many of you think about labor force issues right now, um, and, and we'll definitely talk more about that. Julia Rafel Bear, um, let me ask you what you think the biggest problem is. You're the the assistant, or you were the assistant commissioner of the New York State Education Department and a former COO of Chiefs for Change, and you're currently the managing partner and co-founder of the ILO Group, which is an education consultancy. Thank you so much. Women make up the vast majority of the workforce in our schools, but less than one third of those at the very top of our systems are women. Only 11% are women of color, and these numbers have barely budged for more than a decade. In education, 
Put simply, we have systems that were designed by and for white men and in a very different time in our country with what it looked like for our families. It's a problem because schools are precisely the place where we tell children they can be anything they wanna be and we need to model it. The solutions are straightforward. Things like tackling the pay gap, driving more family-friendly policies, examining gender bias on school boards and selection committees and growing networking opportunities. The programming is there. I helped to found some of this at Chiefs for Change under women in leadership, but now we need to get intentional and put our foot on the gas. It's really interesting. I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing more about that. D Dr. Uh, Clarence Nixon, you're the founder and president of T-Lab, which is an accelerated learning center for students in grades K through 12. You said, it, you told me it was a, like a, an after school program on steroids. As you look at the education landscape, what do you think the biggest problem is? One significant problem, uh, there are multiple significant problems. However, one significant problem is that our existing educational system is antiquated and based on requirements of an agricultural marketplace. I propose that new educational systems be developed that are based on a digital marketplace and the standard competencies of math, science, reading, and language. Additionally, we should integrate technology data science and finance into the base curriculum. Finally, we cannot afford to get rid of standardized tests such as ACT and SAT. They should be enhanced and expanded to include additional disciplines. That is really interesting. And I'm looking forward to hearing more of your thoughts on that. And, and talking about trying to expand the curriculum is perfect because next is Jenny McGarra, who is a best-selling author and is also the global head of education impact for Google. Jenny, what do you think is the biggest problem that we ought to be talking about right now? I'm so glad I got to go after Dr. Nixon because you teed it up. I agree completely. I think the existing system is antiquated. There's a lack of agility and a focus on student agency. Um, Andy Hargreaves said that we should measure what we value instead of valuing only what we can measure. I agree standardized assessments are important, but the more, um, the lower resource and the more at risk a student body is, the more tied to the test they are. And I think the test isn't focusing on the right things, on really measuring creativity and human, uh, human needs. So I think at Google, we're working really hard to create agile tools so that folks can focus on the whole student, their social emotional needs, and really make sure that the time they spend during school is focused on uh, growing as a full person and their entire intersectional glory. And this is fascinating because obviously during the pandemic, there has been so much change about how we're delivering education, about whether schools are using standardized tests and, and revealing to us some of the, the, the consequences, unintended and intended, of making changes which we, within our education system, that some of, some of which we didn't plan for. Which brings me to our final person, who's, who's of course been at the forefront of trying to use distance delivery and digital delivery of education for a number of years. Saul Khan is the founder of the Khan Academy, whose educational videos have been viewed by more than 1.8 billion times by children around the world. Saul, what do you think the biggest problem is? Well, the biggest problem is how many people go through the traditional system year after year, having gaps in their knowledge, and eventually they get to a point and they get assessed and they don't know much. In the United States, 70% of kids go to community college, 65% at, say, the Cal State system. They have to take remedial math with the seventh grade. That's after years and years of algebra and trigonometry and all of these things. To, to solve the problem, you have to go to a mastery-based solution where kids have the opportunity and incentive to fill those gaps. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you to, uh, thanks for joining us. Thank you for all those answers. I'm really looking forward to getting into the conversation around this. And I also wanted to, to take a moment just to thank our partners who made today possible. Um, we were enormously glad to be joined by the fellows from the Aspen Global Leadership Network and changemakers who are streaming live from all around the world. And I'd also love to give a huge thanks to the architects of the Mucha platform, Vit Horky and Alex Braun, Ruben Sagala and Tara Hovey, Pete Cadence and Tavit Henricus, and also to our partners, Google's for start Google for Startups, the Cadence Family Foundation, the Aspen Global Leadership Network, the Resnick Aspen Action Forum, and JAD Digital Agency.
Thank you to all of you for your support and for making today possible. Okay, so now we're going to jump into a master class, a, a conversation to try and learn a little bit about and set, learn a little bit about these topics and to set up the conversation between all of our guests and panelists to about where we ought to go from here. And and for this master class, we want to focus on the work of Sal Khan, who you just heard from, who will be interviewed by Stacy Tank. Stacy has spent the last twenty years working for Fortune five hundred companies, and and beyond her role of transforming businesses. She's also the founder of Our Happy Place, which is a nonprofit dedicated to serving children and families who are navigating anxiety and other mental wellness challenges. And so with that, let me welcome Sal and Stacy to tell us a little bit about their work. Right, Sal, today we're talking about the search for moonshot ideas that can solve America's education challenges. Now you're a great example of a moonshotter who took a simple idea and you took it all the way to the moon. We'd love to hear some of your thoughts, your counsel, as we inspire the next generation of change makers on their version of the journey to the moon. So maybe we start with the following question. What are the three things that made the biggest difference when you were founding the Khan Academy? Yeah, first of all, great to be here, Stacy. You know, I think the biggest thing, a lot of people know the early days of Khan Academy. You know, I was originally in tech and then I was an analyst at a hedge fund and uh, one of my cousins needed tutoring. So I started tutoring her remotely and uh, word spread in my family free tutoring was going on. I started writing software for them because I saw patterns that they were having gaps in their knowledge. And I always knew in the back of my mind that something like software, if it worked for one or five cousins, it could work for five million or five billion cousins one day. So that was always a little bit of a delusional idea in the back of my mind. Uh, and then I started making videos and uh, videos, especially with distribution platforms like YouTube, also could scale arbitrarily. And then when I saw that the combination of the software and the videos was really helping my cousins, I started saying, hey, maybe, maybe there could be something interesting here. And a lot of folks know this in 2009 uh, that I quit my day job to set up Khan Academy as a not-for-profit. And I think this was probably the first moment where I had to decide how moonshotty I wanted to be. Uh, I, I definitely had, I live in Silicon Valley, a lot of my friends are venture capitalists, and they reached out and they said, hey, we use your material with our kids, word spread around that you've got some interesting stuff going on. We could write a check right now, you could be a venture-backed you know, startup. And it was tempting, uh, but by the second or third meeting, and I'm, I'm a big fan of for-profit, I'm a big fan of capitalism, I'm a big fan of venture-backed startups, I obviously worked at a hedge fund, so that's about as for-profit as you can get. But but for this domain in education, the second or third meetings, I at least for what I wanted to do, just didn't feel exactly right. I was getting letters from students, from parents all over the world, saying how these resources were helping them, how it was helping them go back to school, how it was helping them uh, get a job after leaving the military, how it was helping their children. And so I was, it really felt like there was something more fundamental at, at play here. I've worked for mostly Fortune 25 companies for the last couple of decades, and we talk a lot about focus, but I guess it's relevant no matter what you're doing, you can get pulled in so many directions and get distracted and end up uh, getting you know a little bit done on a lot of things instead of a lot of done against one clear mission. So it makes a ton of sense. You were talking before about working in the hedge fund space, and then you had to make this decision to jump in with both feet. And that's a terrifying decision. So curious your thoughts on career multitasking. Are you a fan of, and have you seen it work where you can kind of dual path, you know, have a few um, different roles and sometimes simply for economic reasons. I, I have a lot of friends who have done that to just be able to pay the mortgage until their venture can get off its feet. But there was a point when you jumped. So can you talk to us? How do you think about this career multitasking theme? Yeah, actually, I'll touch on career multitasking and your last comment around focus, because in some ways they're related, even on kind of your own your own personalized focus. It's interesting. Uh, Reed Reed Hastings, who's one of Khan Academy's early major donors, I remember he came into our little thousand square foot office on top of a coffee shop in downtown Mountain View in the early days, and he we were talking about focus, and he said, "Sal, focus isn't what you do; it's what you don't do." And like, there's something about that meeting that really resonated with me. I was very defensive at the moment. I was like, "No, no, no, we're very focused," but we probably weren't. Although. I will say at that stage of an organization, 
there is a benefit for trying a lot of things and seeing what sticks to the wall and saying, okay, this is maybe where we have something. I will also say, you, you know, in, in, in business or nonprofits or any organization, it's a very in vogue. You can always win an argument by saying more rigor or more focus, right? Like those are always like, it's hard to disagree with those things. But I would say there's kind of a double lens of focus because, you know, with our mission, free world-class education for anyone, anywhere, that's a big mission. And if you stay too narrowly focused, you're never going to be able to do that. So I think you need to have this, I think you have to have an absolute, if you have to have a strong mission and vision that you, you can believe in and stay laser focused on that. And then, yes, you only have a certain amount of capacity in any given time. And then you have to serialize your activities so that you can eventually, you can eventually get that. To your, your question about your life, I kind of think it's similar. I think you, you should have a, you know, no one, especially in your 20s and 30s, sometimes in your 40s or 50s, you don't know exactly what your purpose of life is going to be. Uh, but I think many people have a sense of what they would like, you know, at least aesthetically, what, what they would want it to be like. And I think keep a laser focus on that, you know, and it's not just career, it's rich friendships, it's your family, it's your health, but it's also, hey, I want to do something that I find meaning in that really expresses certain superpowers, which I feel like I can give to the world. And when I uh, worked in uh, the hedge fund, I used to always tell my friends, I would do this long enough so that I could start a school on my own terms. Uh, so it was always in the back of my mind. No one really believed me. But then when this tutoring with my cousins, I was like, okay, this is, something is starting to happen here. Let me not waste this. Let me run through that door that just is slightly cracked open. But I did it in a way, to your point, where I really was able to hedge, not no pun intended, hedge my, my situation, uh, where I had a good job. Uh, luckily, uh, you know, my boss at the hedge funds, Dan Wool, have to give him full credit here. He did not believe as investors, we should be working 80 hours a week. He actually thought that that was a recipe for bad decisions. He says our job at, as investors are to be creative and to avoid bad decisions. If we can do those things, we'll be great investors. And the best way to be creative and avoid bad decisions is to have a life <laughs> and, and to do other things with your life. So to your point, I was able to create this parallel structure. And, and if I look back on my life, I've always had that. Every job I've had, you know, my first job was at Oracle. I, I'm, I'm sure the Oracle folks wouldn't mind this. I, I was a good product manager, uh, but I was always working on something else too. <laughs> I always on my weekends, I was working on this startup or that startup. No, I love that. And I think being curious and a good learner also shifts your relationship to change. Because as humans, there's, you know, you can have that push it away. This is scary. Let me brace for impact. Or you can say, okay, change. I'm getting curious about this change. Now I want to explore this change and I see it as opportunity instead of, instead of a risk. So beautiful. Well, I think we have to leave it there, but thank you so much for joining us. And as a parent, I thank you very, very much for the gifts that you're bestowing to the world. It's really been a pleasure speaking with you. Thanks for having me. Okay, so let's talk about how to make, how, what other moonshots should be top of mind for us, what we should be encouraging people to think about and to be working on. And, and because we want this conversation to be rooted in data and, and an understanding about how education has changed during the pandemic, let me introduce really quickly uh, a special guest to tell us a little bit about some polling that we've done and data collection about what's happened to education during the pandemic. Hello, Moonshot Aspen. This is Gritan from Harris Sachs to share with you the findings of an exclusive poll commissioned this session. The poll is around the impact of the coronavirus pandemic on the quality of children's education and academic performance, as well as their mental health. In the United States, only 19% of parents believe that the quality of their children's education dropped. However, when we survey children 13 plus, a full 34% of them believe that the quality of their education has declined. Overall, 80% of parents today believe that their children are getting high quality education. However, when we survey children, only 64 of K through 12 respondents believe that they are getting high quality education. So the question is, why are, do parents believe that their children are getting education that is better in quality than their children themselves are communicating. 
There's obviously a big gap here between what kids feel like they're getting and what parents believe that kids are getting. And, and so I want to open up this conversation and, and ask our panelists for, for solutions, but also encourage all of you who are watching to submit your questions and your thoughts and to volunteer your ideas about what we ought to do. And so let me start with this basic question, which is, what is the moonshot that we should be pursuing right now? in order to solve the problems that you had ad identified before. And let's go ahead and start with you, Dr. Jackson. And, and this is an open conversation. You had mentioned that one of the biggest problems is this lack of access to a high quality curriculum. If you had all the resources in the world, if, if, if we, we suddenly made you president for a day, what's the moonshot? What solves that problem for everyone in America? Yeah. Well, I think what we're trying to model in Chicago, and it is scalable because we have 350,000 students, has implications nationally. But if you listen to the data that was just lifted up in the poll, the organization that jumps out at me that's doing this work is the Castle Organization, which is the Collaborative for Academic and Social and Emotional Learning. They're basically bringing together decision makers, policy makers, legislators, as well as school-based people working directly with our students to address these issues that have been magnified due to the pandemic. And so as we begin to welcome students back into our classrooms across the country, we have to pay attention to both the academic needs as well as the SEL needs. And I will go further to say that that data that was shared, I think the numbers are even more disparate when you look at urban areas, when you ask parents about the quality of education they think their kids are receiving, and when students talk about their experiences. So I think there's much more that we need to do, but it's going to require collective action in order for us to make meaningful progress. I, I absolutely agree. Let me ask, which of you feel like yeah. collective action has worked successfully in your communities? Is, is there anyone who feels like you've been able to create a change by bringing a community together that, that normally wasn't talking to each other? Let me, let me jump in, Charles. Um, interesting, I'd like to see that survey for Minnesota. Minnesota is known as the education state, and I would suspect outside of urban areas, uh, uh, our inner city that most parents think they're getting a, a, a good educational system and the kids are too. Where we're failing is in poverty areas in the ghetto. And, and, and what I would say is uh, we as a country have failed to recognize the importance that education doesn't begin at age five at kindergarten. The neurosciences tell us that that brain development begins at birth. It actually begins prenatal. And we've We've basically underfunded that, especially for our poverty children. Fortunately, the president of the United States on April 28th in his address to Congress made the right point that when we know the research tells us this, that if children start school healthy and ready to learn with an engaged parent, they're much more likely to succeed in school and, and succeed in life. Where we're failing, and I think the gap I think we should focus on is this achievement gap and the science tells us how to fix it. We know how to do this. And so fortunately, we've got the president of the United States saying this. We have many states around the country now supporting high quality early education. Education begins at birth. I think we have to make that clear. I think there's lots of problems we have to solve. We can definitely do better with K through 12, with a whole lot of, a whole lot of things. But I think the key problem, the key issue that we have failed to understand is Education doesn't begin in kindergarten. It begins with those parents at birth. And that's what we have to focus on. That's what we have to fund. We're way underfunding that, that, that part of education and health. I want to agree that. I think it's a. Um, okay. Go ahead, Jenny. I was going to say, I, I agree completely. As, as a mom of a almost three-year-old, I'm already seeing how much she's growing and learning from, from birth. And I, I, I completely agree as I look for school opportunities for her, she needs to begin early. One place I'd like to double click and push on is, is what is it that I'm teaching her and what am I focusing on? To um, echo what you said, Dr. Jackson, I agree completely about Castle being a thought leader here and thinking about social emotional as core to what educators are focusing on in schools. The poll numbers that you shared don't surprise me. I've worked with young people throughout the past year and a half um, in my role at Google. And what I'm finding is they're feeling isolated, getting on these video conferences and, and, and trying to have teachers hit the standards and, and teach what they've always been teaching is 
it hasn't always felt as connected and as emotionally secure and safe as when they were face to face in school with teachers who they knew cared deeply about them, having interactions in the hallway, socializing and communicating with their peers. And a lot of times that was their only social interaction. They were stuck in their homes and completely isolated. And we find that the most historically marginalized and underserved uh, populations were most at risk during this uh, during this pandemic and were so mo therefore most isolated. So again, you know, going back to that quote from Hindia Hargreaves, I think that what happened, and I saw this with the educators that we were supporting, when we went remote, educators went to the, the core brass tacks of what they were used to in schools, and parents did too. Are you reading? Are you writing? Are you doing your homework? What's the schema? What's the situation I was used to as an educator, as a student a decade ago, two decades ago? And if parents saw that, oh, they're doing homework, they're doing their arithmetic, they're reading, they're like, great, they're still learning. But what we're not valuing and measuring as well as we should be is the, um, the amazing amount of effort and magic that educators, that classroom teachers go through every day to serve the whole child, the social emotional needs and the student agency bits that didn't that got dropped during the pandemic. And so I think technology is a really great way to reach those SEL needs and that whole student, but we need to value it, measure it, and center it in part of our core educational model. It can't be an afterthought. And so I see people using Google Classroom all the time for mood check-ins, for um, student portfolios to check in on, on what the students are feeling and needing. And that makes me so happy because that's really focusing on the entirety of the child. Can I just jump in real quick? Um, so I agree with all the speakers so far. And one of the things that we discovered during the pandemic um, is quite frankly that parents who had the means uh, resorted to creating pods and sending their kids to schools that had all of the elements that um, folks here are talking about. The ones who did not have those options were again, low income families. And when you look at the gaps in achievement right now between um, the rich and the poor, those gaps have been have grown quite substantially. Uh, the only thing that a lot of families discovered during the pandemic is the importance of having options if their districts were not able to offer remote learning well uh, or even to do technology properly. A lot of districts, the one that I'm in, certainly struggled with some basic things that districts ought to be able to do by now. Um, those you know, so fa families for the first time sought other options. And again, this is the point in time where we really need to go back and look at the numbers of how many parents moved to different schools. A lot of them ended up in charter schools. Enrollment rates in public charter schools rose in every state that had a charter school law. And so the, kind of the question on the table is what do we do next? How do we leverage the fact that so many families were making some educated choices and putting their kids in settings that fit their students' needs and making sure that they continue offering a customized education rather than to send them back to one size fits all systems that may or may not necessarily meet those unique needs. One thing I just want to I have add a, on to maybe this. A, a different perspective, a different point of view. Um, I, I still say that there's a need for a pretty significant shift in paradigm. Um, it's almost like being the uh, best patient uh, in intensive care. Uh, if, if you look at the numbers, 94% uh, of African-American students don't meet the benchmark for ACT. However, 67% 67, 67 of white students don't meet the benchmark. 48% of Asian students don't meet the benchmark. So we're looking at a system that I think is broken. And so some of the things that I think must be done, I think we must return the character. You know, one of the things that Dr. King said was that the purpose of education was obviously to drive intellect, but he said to develop character. Uh, looking at the current situation that occurred uh, with the pandemic, with those students having correct character, being disciplined, uh, being at home presented too many opportunities for them to learn, develop, and grow. And so uh, I think there is a need, once again, for a significant shift in paradigm in terms of what's happening in education. I think the focus should be on competence and not necessarily on grades. Everybody knows and understands that there is great inflation, and parents and students are so influenced by grades. And so here it is, you know, we had students getting 4.0, but 
but then they can't pass remedial courses in college. And so that kind of stuff, we have to stop. I would just add to the, the conversation. I agree with everything that's been said, but would also just emphasize just how important leadership is in these moments and how important it is to have great leaders at the top of these systems that deeply understand the students they're serving. When I think about the incredible work that Dr. Jackson has done in Chicago and how much students there are beating the odds, it also comes with what Sal Khan was just saying before about focus. Dr. Jackson and her team had an incredible focus. They knew how to focus on that intersection of the mental, emotional, physical well-being of kids along with really fast charging on academics, and that leads to results. And I think so much of the work ahead is really getting to that clear focus about just how much leadership matters and how do we keep growing the diversity at the top of our systems so that we see more well-prepared and diverse leaders who are at the top of these systems driving these decisions, keeping the focus and helping to really write a new playbook mm -hmm. for how our systems are working. Yeah. If I could just double click on Julia's point um, really around the importance of leadership, um, I think she highlighted for a variety of reasons why it matters. But I think if you even look at the way the pandemic played out, superintendents were at the nexus of everything that happened. And what we learned, number one, is that they're awesome and persevered. But we also learned that there wasn't a whole lot of support to help superintendents who are making extremely important consequential decisions without a whole lot of information. If you all remember, I know it seems like a lifetime ago, but we were learning new things about COVID every single day. I think the other thing that's important to highlight, though, is that diversity does matter because the way in which you approach solving these problems is going to be based on your perspective. So it's no secret that I pushed hard to get students back into school because what I know from my experience growing up in a low income area is that schools are a safety net and that any fantasy that students are sitting at home accessing education and curriculum and interacting with teachers remotely the same way they do in a, a traditional environment is just that, a fantasy. And so I think that leadership really does matter because you have to understand the complexity of these issues. And while we are working to identify moonshots and figure out what's the one thing we can do to kind of double down and leverage, um, and, and get change. I think anyone who's managed a complex system like this knows it's just that it's complex. And so it requires collective action. It requires everybody coming to the table, having equal voice at the table. Parents know just as much as researchers know about what their kids need. And how do we get that information? How do we bring teachers to the table um, because they know they spend the most time with students outside of their families. And um, I know earlier that point was lifted up, but I think we got to bring parents and teachers into the fold and really develop their leadership as well to advocate for their children and be a part of solving these issues. So, so let me ask I, this, I'd like because to I think you're exactly right. The, yeah, go ahead. I'd like to push back just a little bit on, on this matter. I mean, it's, it's almost like, you know, we talk about these things every day, year in, year out. And it's just like there's not a sense of urgency. You know, we're losing kids every day. Every single day we lose. And there must be a greater sense of urgency. And where I believe there should be diversity, if, if that's the term we want to use, is in the area of competence. We just haven't seen the level of competence, and I definitely agree with everybody, among leadership. There is just abs I mean, just very limited technological competence within leadership within this country. Uh, and certainly I'd say, you know, education would be one of the markets that there is some, some challenges there. And so we have to have competent leaders. I think that's the issue. I think the issue for us is competency. People who understand and who are close to the problem. I agree with Dr. Jackson on that one. You must be close to the problem in order to solve it but they must be competent. They must have data competence. They must have technology competence. Those are the things you've got to have in order to solve the problem. I'm in a marketplace where the median ACT score for African-Americans is 14.3. In my organization, our students was 30.5 last year. And so, I mean, it's just a matter of focusing, understanding that technology gives you scale and scope to deliver services to wherever students are. And if the students have the discipline, if they have the character, they can leverage everything that exists to be successful. 
So let me ask, you know, we, we've lived through these 18 months, right, of kind of running, unfortunately, this laboratory of trying to understand different approaches to many of the problems that you guys have, have, have raised up. What have we learned? during the pandemic? Are there groups that are succeeding that are surprising to us? Is there is there unexpected lessons that that hopefully we won't forget? As, as you guys look at your experiences as parents yourself or as educators or as leaders of your organization, what have you learned in the last 18 months that it's important for other people to know? Uh, I'm happy to jump in here and, and provide the point of view of uh, our focus on higher education and, and working with students on, on improving services provided on campus. Uh, I think what we saw over the last 18 months, and if you look at a survey from the CDC uh, in June of last year, uh, one in four students had expressed uh, having experienced suicidal ideation uh, during the, the pandemic. And so that's something that um, I think comes to mind as one of the biggest issues we need to think about uh, on campuses. I think uh, one thing I loved here, you know, in the discussion so far is how we should think about the student as a whole. Um, and to me, the pandemic really uh, put an emphasis on that. Of course, it's about academics. It's about how you think about the quality of the curriculum, uh, but it's also about the student's experience, whether it's in K-12 uh, or in higher education. The reason why enrollment rates are going down across higher education is because um, students have a higher opportunity cost. Uh, they can access education online. Uh, and so how do you think about creating an environment uh, that helps them to grow not only uh, as a learner, but uh, as a human being? Um, and so that's something for me that uh, the pandemic has really, really uh, you know, put a, a spotlight on. Charles, let me just- I think it's a really good point. Things just to dovetail on that, one of the things that we learned um, was that, you know, students shouldn't be in front of a computer for extended periods of time. I mean, this medium um, works for limited amounts of time, but um, full blown remote learning, which is fully virtual, is not healthy for children. Um, and making sure that they have opportunities to do other things with other kids is extremely important. And so this is quite a tragedy. Uh, but again, those schools that were agile enough uh, to make course corrections quickly, uh, those that were willing to uh, open and adhere to certain rules and regulations around safety measures, um, to the extent adults in, in, the, in the home were able to monitor what their kids were doing, um, those were the places where kids thrived, but unfortunately that wasn't the case across the board. And I would also say, since we're talking about early childhood education, that um, a lot of those early childhood education centers stayed open to meet the needs of working families. So um, something about that marketplace uh, worked um, and those educators should definitely be rewarded and thanked far more than they've ever been thanked before. I think it's a really good point. Hey, Art, you had something like to add. Piggyback. Yeah, I want to piggyback on, on Nina's comments because uh, mixed delivery, it really pays off in the pre-K space. Kids are so different. And so for a parent to have a choice to go to either a Montessori or a, a New Horizon or a music-based program or a language-based program, it makes a huge difference that you fit the needs and the parent and the child. I also say one thing that COVID-19, and Nina was mentioning this, Human interaction is so important for learning, especially at the early ages, but I suspect all the way through college. So that, again, going back to the neuroscience, the so important, the neuroscientists tell you that interaction, that positive interaction between the child and the parent develops the brain. In, in the uh, Romanian um, uh, orphan study, they found these extreme neglect. The kids maybe had uh, adult interaction at feedings and that was it. And when they had brain imaging of those kids at age three, the brain was a third smaller than, than a normal brain. We know it's critical to have that human interaction. Technology can play a role, but we, we need that human interaction between professors, teachers, students, and I think COVID-19 has really taught us that. And we're going to have a lot of catching up to do. But I want to go back to the, yeah. in my mind, the critical issue is at the very beginning, that brain is developing at an enormous rate. And whether it develops in a good way or a bad way depends on that positive human interaction. I also and we, learned, we, learned that, we learned that our investment 
we learned that our investment in a virtual platform goes back to 2007. And we learned that we made the right decision. Uh, and so not only did our students uh, excel and soar, but it allowed us to grow uh, and extend our products and services to students in, in Nigeria, in the Philippines, uh, in Lebanon. And the cultural exchange that has occurred between the students has just been so significant. And so when you, when you look and you look at the opportunities that exist for students in other countries and you compare that with the U.S., you found that U.S. students are very much uh, blessed and they've had tr tremendous opportunities. But students in other countries who don't have those opportunities really have taken advantage of it. And so I, I think it has indicated and it has demonstrated that uh, you have no choice. You, you have to where the market is. Uh, digital technology, it's a digital market. It's a data market. I mean, we can fight. We can scream and kick and don't want to go with it, but you have to go with it. You know, moving forward, the marketplace will have two basic types of workers. You'll have knowledge workers and you'll have warm bodies. And based off the discussion that I'm hearing, I don't see where we're going to be able to produce the number of knowledge workers that we need in order to meet the demands and the needs of the marketplace. If I, if I could- Jenny, I know that you had something to say. I wanted to come back to you, um, if you don't mind. It, I, we actually have a question teed up it, that I think that you're going to have some thoughts on. I, we actually have someone from the Aspen Leaders Room, Stephanie Wu, who's from City Year. Stephanie, what's your question? And, and then, Jenny, I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. Yes, great, thanks. And it is picking up on Dr. Jackson and Jenny's comments about social emotional learning and relationships or whole child learning. My question is, can you talk, I'd love to hear a little bit more about the role of relationships in whole child learning and how we might be able to think about technology to strengthen relationships for learning um, in the school setting rather than diminish them. I We definitely experienced we saw that um, schools that we were working in during the pandemic that we considered to have stronger um, relational trust in the school building and with students and families um, had higher attendance during the pandemic, both virtually or in a hybrid situation. So I was just curious to hear the experts talk a little bit about that. Thank you. Jenny, what are your thoughts on that? I know that you, you had something that... that yes. Absolutely. And Stephanie, thank you so much for that question. I it's it's exactly what um, we're focusing on and, and so important. You know, I, I think about the movie. There was a there was a, a Star Trek movie that came out a few years ago where they show the Vulcans um, and all and Spock as a young boy and they're all learning in the Vulcan Learning Center and they're in um, these like holes in the ground with these giant panoramic screens and they're literally in a physical silo. There's like hundreds of kids in this ballroom all learning by themselves in these screens and it's the exact opposite of how technology should be used. It's isolating students. But um, in the previous question, Charles asked like, what were the bright spots of what we learned and folks doing uh, school in a really innovative way during the pandemic? And for me, it was it were schools that supported their educators and learning how to leverage technology to strengthen relationships. And there's so many barriers to that, right? There's the screen, there's access to technology, but we saw some really creative ways where schools were doing things like, again, using, using tools like there's a tool called Class Catalyst. If you haven't seen it, check it out. It allows you to do mood check-ins with your students. It allows you for the students to self-analyze their social emotional well-being on a daily basis. It gives reports to the parent and the teacher. And it's all about students having agency in their emotional well-being and growth and deepening that relationship. I saw teachers doing small group Google meets with their students, not about the academics, but just digging in. How are you today? How are you feeling? How is it going? Like, you know, a student struggling with figuring out how to do laundry because their parents were working three shift jobs to make ends meet because they were laid off during the, for their normal nine to five job due to COVID. And just talking about like laundry tips. And we had like Google Docs of teachers creating like, how do you design your day when you're home at, at home? So there were all these creative ways that teachers were leveraging technology to deepen the relationship 
and to make sure that they were focusing on the children's emotional needs first, because if they're not feeling emotionally safe and secure, they're not able to fully digest and absorb the content. So thank you for the question. And I think for me, that was a bright spot is seeing how educators use technology to become more human and to better connect. This is all fascinating, and, and we're going to get a lot more time to talk about these questions and, and to explore them a little bit more. Um, and actually, we have one more question uh, from, from someone in the audience. Go ahead. My question is for Dr. Nixon. What was the impetus for your uh, T-Lab's drive to 25 to improve ACT scores, given that so many institutions were pu pushing back on the use of, of institutionalized testing systems for education? The, the, the impetus was, uh, and, and still is, uh, African Americans were performing at the actual lowest level. Uh, when we looked at uh, the median ACT scores for top universities, they were all top 1%, anywhere between 36 and 33. Um, and only 94% of African Americans were meeting the bare minimum benchmark. ACT happened to be a standard way of measuring competence throughout the country uh, where you didn't have to depend on grade. So... Uh, in those ACT scores, uh, you know, we even look beyond that. And when you look at African-American performance on LSTAT, which is law school, MCAT, which is medical school, DAT, which is dental school, GMAT, graduate school, GRE, African-Americans still have the lowest median scores. Uh, and so we believe that it's all about developing competence and building competence. But up front in that issue uh, is the whole issue of character I think Dr. King said it so clearly that that was that has to be a sense of education. And as well, Dr. King said that poverty was not an excuse for children to learn. And so uh, our initiative has been an initiative that we believe is a moonshot. And, you're, and we're building a pipeline of 250,000 young people. And we believe we're going to realize that objective of uh, the median score of 25. Asian students have the highest median ACT score today at 24.99, and Asian students have the best social outcomes, they have the best financial outcomes, and so we correlation is a great correlation that, uh, that we think is worthwhile going after. Thank you for that. And, and that was from Joyce Johnson at Pacific Gate Capital. We're, we're gonna continue talking about this and getting more deeper into these topics. But I wanna take one moment to, to poll our audience because as you've been thinking about this, as many of you have been working on this, these questions and, and addressing these issues in your own lives, we wanna get some feedback from you. So if you don't mind, we're gonna take one minute and, and we're gonna do a quick poll. As you've heard about different issues that have been raised by the panelists about what we ought to be focused on, and focus of course is, is important even though we wanna do everything. Here's the polling question that I'd love you to answer. Of, of these three kinds of different challenges, which poses the biggest obstacle to quality education? Is it inequality, which has come up quite a bit, the income and racial and geographic disparities that a number of people, including Nina, has mentioned? Is it the technological gaps, um, the, the fact that some people have access to the right equipment and software and others don't? Is it, a, is it a teaching approach that, that as, as a number of people have mentioned, including Dr. Nixon, that we don't have teachers focusing on the right capabilities for today and tomorrow? Um, there's a, there's a, there should be on your screen an ability to, to vote on those three, one of those three things and choose, them, choose which youth challenge you think is the biggest obstacle right now. And you have 60 seconds to answer. Um, and for those of you who are streaming online on YouTube or Facebook or LinkedIn, you can come and join the poll on slido.com, or sorry, www.sli.do, slido, and you can use the event code hashtag moonshot. And while everyone's participating in the poll, um, let me introduce some of the leaders who are joining us from the Aspen Leaders Room, where we invited change makers to come in because we wanted to highlight some of the work that they've done to, that's having an impact on society. 
There's um, uh, Mrs. Jewel Burks, who's the head of Google for startups and a U.S. and managing partner at Collab Capital. Um, we're also joined by Milan Vashina, who's the executive director of the Aspen Institute in Central Europe. Uh, Judith Ado Saltus is the CEO of Caswell Communications and Caswell Capital Partners, Ghana Limited. And then Mr. Um, Kaolin Kerr, who's the founder and CEO of One City Schools. So hopefully you've gotten a chance to vote on the poll. Let's go ahead and um, and bring up the, the results and see what folks thought. So just to remind you, so it looks like there's actually a pretty, this is interesting because so so about 47% of people said that the biggest problem right now is inequality. The fact that we have these income and racial and geographical disparities and almost an equivalent amount said that the problem was the teaching approach, that we're not focusing on teaching the right capabilities for today and tomorrow. Very few people thought that it was a technological gap, that the access to the right equipment or the right software was the issue. And that's interesting because at the beginning of the pandemic, we spent a lot of time talking about getting computers to kids, whether, the, whether everyone had access to the equipment that they needed. But it, it seems, at least from this audience, that some of that some of that anxiety has lessened, but it's focused on the, the things that, the problems that are harder to solve, such as how do we actually create schools where everyone has a quality to access to the right kinds of lessons, to, regardless of where they live. Um, and, and thank you for submitting your opinions. If, if you haven't already submitted an idea in the, in the Moonshot Impact Gallery, I would invite you to do so because we'd love to hear about your experiences with different organizations, with different innovators, and highlight in the same way that our panelists were, we, we helped us with, highlight those groups and those people who deserve our attention. Um, and hopefully, hopefully make other people aware so that we can move some resources and some energy towards them. That's one small step for man. You know, it, it, one of the things that I think came out of this last conversation is that education is really complex, which all of you know. In fact, the path to education is oftentimes as complex as the education itself, as Dr. Jackson mentioned. And so I'd like to take one moment just to introduce you to a moonshot story, a, a profile of a smart solution that's come out from the Common App, as, as well as a message from former First Lady Michelle Obama. Hi, I'm Jenny Ricard, President and CEO of Common App. We know that education is a fundamental opportunity to create an equitable society, but we must use this opportunity to change the process at its core. We must focus on students first through an equity lens. We must turn the dynamic of exclusion into one of inclusion that empowers students to pursue their dreams. And at Common App, we realize that small changes we're making to the process can lead to more large scale change. And as we ramp up our efforts, we believe the revolution we're starting with our college and university members will have an impact on students and society for generations to come. We certainly can't do this alone, and I'm excited to see so many leaders from across industries uniting for a better future for education. I hope you enjoy the conference. Hello to all of the parents out there. After years of parent-teacher conferences and back-to-school supply runs, here you are. Your child is already applying to higher education. There are all kinds of deadlines and forms, all kinds of phrases like personal statement and cost of attendance, and then there's FAFSA, not easy to say. It's a lot to sort out, especially if you've never been through the process yourself. That was true for my parents. They didn't go to college, and the experience was new for all of us. But my mom and dad did everything they could to ensure my brother and I got the education we wanted. By the time my dad dropped me off at my freshman dorm, I was still a little nervous, but I was ready to dive in and start a new phase in my life. And today I look back at the way my parents prioritized our education as one of the most foundational aspects of my entire life story. So whether your children are going away to college or staying at home, whether they choose to go to a four-year school or a community college or a certification program, they need you on this journey, even if they don't always want to admit it. So talk with your child about what kind of environment excites them. Go see their school counselor and ask every question you have. 
And I can't emphasize this one enough. Don't forget to fill out the FAFSA, the free application for federal student aid. Just go to fafsa.gov. There's free money there for you and your child to help pay for college. Most of all, I hope you'll always remember this. Education is still the best investment we can make for our children. So everything you're about to go through, I promise it's worth it. So embrace that opportunity. And congratulations again on making it this far. Man, don't you miss the, having the Obamas on our news, on our screens every single day? It's fantastic to, uh, to see them again. So, okay. So, you know, the Common App is one of the innovations that has, is a moonshot idea that has helped a lot of people, as is FAFSA a number of years ago, making it easier to apply for financial aid. And so now we're back with our speakers, and I want to ask you the, the question that, that Michelle Obama and, and the video just answered, which is, what is the moonshot idea for American education that you believe deserves more attention? Again, 30 seconds per person. Feel free to mention an organization, an idea, an individual. Let's go ahead and start with Dr. Jackson again. What idea should people know about? Yeah, uh, well, I mentioned, mentioned it earlier, but just definitely want to amplify the role of uh, CASEL and really bring in together collective impact. I mean, we've talked a lot about all the people and resources that we need to bring to bear, um, but I really am a firm believer that it can't be done without bringing everyone together. But technology pay, plays a big role, so I can't wait to hear more about uh, Mantra and how we're leveraging technology to support mental health, because I think that's the next step um, for districts like Chicago that are massive. Um, we're, we've converted ourselves to a healing centered district, which I think is critically important. And again, this will equip teachers as well as uh, leaders of our building to better identify issues that students are facing, but more importantly, connect students with the resources that they need in order to address those issues. I'm Googling Castle as soon as, as, soon as this is over, yeah. learning more about it. Art. Yeah. Art Rolnick, yeah. what do you think is the, the one organization or idea that we need to know about? Yeah, I want to give a shout out to an organization called the Northside Achievement Zone, known as NAS, which is one of President Obama's promised neighborhoods. And, and their whole mission is to close the achievement gap and end intergenerational poverty. And they do that by wrapping around, to wrap around service with these families, including parent mentors, which start prenatal, early learning scholarships, visiting these families on a regular basis, planning with them. They have their back. They're doing this in North Minneapolis. They're doing with this with some of some of the most uh, lowest income families, and it's working. We have the data to show that the kids are starting school ready. Uh, they're doing significantly better by the third grade than typical poverty families. And they're and they're mentally and and emotional emotionally and physically healthier. So we're not just talking about theory. This is in practice working, and it is scalable. Northside Achievement Zone. President Obama had this vision. It's working. Oh man, this is great. This is like this is like building out all of like the donations I can give this year. Nina, what do you think? What's a what's a group or an organization that we need to know about? Well, as I mentioned, uh, my moonshot is to make sure that every child has access to a great public school in this country, regardless of their socioeconomic background. Public charter schools are one way to make sure children have access to these great schools within their own community. The National Alliance for Public Charter Schools uh, is an organization who is dedicated to ensuring access to more students to attend charter schools and to attract more educators to open these great schools. There are 3.3 million students currently in charter schools. We did a survey a couple of years ago that discovered 5 million more families would send their children to these schools if one was available to them. So that is my moonshot. Ed, uh, you know, Mantra Health itself is kind of a moonshot, but it, is there a, another idea or organization that, that you think deserves attention? Uh, unfortunately, I had to pick my uh, my own organization for this one. Uh, so uh, That's it'll fine. be tough for me not to mention <laughs> Mantra and a little bit more about the work we're, we're doing to improve access to, to quality mental health care for all. 
uh, 20 million university students around the country. Uh, what I wanted to talk about was on the philanthropic side, you know, our key area of focus is increasing access specifically for BIPOC uh, and LGBT student populations. Uh, this year we launched the Mantra Diversity Scholarship. We donated uh, $3,000 to a graduate student of color pursuing a career in mental health. I think encouraging more diversity uh, in providers will be a key lever to ensure every young adult, no matter uh, of their identity, gets access to, to mental health care. And, and that's what we're trying to do. Julia, you've spent a lot of time thinking about diversity in leadership and particularly empowering women to step into those roles. W what's an organization or an idea that you think deserves more attention? Chiefs for Change is an incredible national nonprofit, the largest network in the country of district and state education leaders as an organization, their board made a commitment to superintendent diversity. We did that under my leadership by pioneering a really successful program called Future Chiefs that has now served more than 50 leaders, half of who've gone on to lead states and districts. 82% of them are leaders of color, half are women. We need to expand that work at Chiefs for Change. My team at ILO Group is going to be completely focused on helping to really expand the women-only programming, making sure there is a new generation of women leaders, particularly women of color, who are better supported at earlier career stages so that the top of our education systems is far stronger in the type of leadership that's serving our students, but it's going to require coordinated effort. Dr. Nixon, you, you've spent a long time working with communities that have been unfairly disadvantaged. Is there a group or an idea that, that you feel like really people ought to know about? There are several. And, you know, like Ed, I'll have to say my own. I think our Drive to 25 is a significant initiative that's a game changer. So I, I'd say that. You know, and, and, and once again, you know, our median ACT score is 30.7, not 30.5. And 95% of our students are pursuing disciplines in college. We've done $16.8 million in, in academic scholarships. And I'll tell everybody, academic scholarships exist for students to go after. But guess what? They're not going after them. But I'd say that there are two other organizations, a great organization in Chicago, Ivy League Tutoring, one of the best math-based tutoring organizations on the planet. And then the other organization is Ecotech Labs, headquartered in Detroit. Uh, they drive math and science as well. Jenny, I imagine um, from your viewpoint at Google, you probably hear from a lot of organizations that are hoping to partner with Google. What, what, what have you been impressed by and, and that you think people should know about? Absolutely. So access quality content and quality resources is something that we need to make sure every young person in the world has access to. And our philanthropic arm here at Google, google.org, has supported an amazing foundation called Learning Equality to create a program called Colibri, which allows open source and curated access to free educational resources to students all around the world, especially those who have low access to internet, low income devices or low cost devices. The thing I love most about this uh, program is that it allows educators and local communities to customize the resources. So it's not cutting educators out of the equation, it's providing more access to resources and empowering educators to get their students the best possible resources to learn. That's fantastic to hear about. And, and Sal, do you have any thoughts on, on this question? Okay. Yeah, you know, look, at Khan Academy, we pride ourselves in trying to be as moody as I get, as we get. I, I think that's kind of our lane in education. Everyone else is trying to solve the, and we try to meet the world where it is, but I think big, how do we literally educate humanity? Think about credentials, personalized learning, but we take inspiration from the Googles of the world that are trying to collect the world's information, the specs of the world that are literally trying to explore the cosmos, Teslas of the world that are trying to electrify humanity. Fantastic. So, so these are great. These are great suggestions. They're great things for us to know about. And, and for everyone who's watching, the Moonshot Gallery has been updated and expanded to include all of these organizations that you just heard about, as well as many more projects that deserve attention. Um, if you want, you can go to moonshotplatform.live and you'll find the projects and people who have already made their mark on the Moonshot nominations and find ways to support those ideas. Um, 
So this has been a great discussion about education, and, and it perfectly sets up today's second topic, which is the mental health of students, something that we've already talked about quite a bit, but that I think is so important that it deserves its own, its own attention and its own education. So we'll spend the second half of this conference looking at mental health and, and what we can do, as many of you mentioned, the panelists, to try and intervene and improve the mental health education around for students and to help mental students health themselves. So let's start by reviewing some of the research that was commissioned for today's Moonshot Conference about mental health. Hello, Moonshot Aspen. Now we turn to the issue of mental health. Mental health is a top concern and a top priority amongst K through 12 students. 74% report in our survey that they think about mental health issues and they deal with mental health issues on a day-to-day -day basis. Further to that, 54% of K through 12 students said that they have battled anxiety. 51% said that they have battled loneliness in the last 12 months and 47% said that they have battled depression. However, we're noticing an access gap when we look at the data. Only 12% report that they have access to a psychologist. Further, parents are often unaware that their children are struggling with mental health. A full 91% of parents in our survey said that their children feel good about their mental health. However, when we asked K through 12 students themselves, only 53% of them said that they feel good about their mental health. So a clear gap in between the perceptions of parents, the views of parents about their children's mental health, as well as the children's own views and own perceptions and own struggles with it. This gap extends to satisfaction with the resources provided by schools for children and their mental health in terms of reaching out for mental health services, 81% of parents believe that their children feel comfortable or are comfortable reaching out for help and support. However, only 48% of K-12 children report the same. This is obviously something we're all thinking about. And, and those of us who are parents have lived through this over the last 18 months, worrying about the mental health of our kids, of, of the students we teach, of the friends that we have. And so I, I wanna open up another brainstorming conversation, a, bit, a big open conversation. Those of you who are watching, feel free to submit your questions or thoughts on Slido. Those in the Aspen Leaders Room, please feel free to, to chime in with your questions. I think all of us would agree that mental health isn't discussed enough in the institutional conversations about around education around kids. Um, and in addition, when it came to the pandemic, there was this excessive digital media, right? And everyone mentioned that that we know that screens can't replace teachers. So, so let me ask this first question, and, and please feel free to chime in with your thoughts. When you were watching students during the lockdown. What coping strategies did you see students turning to? And can we learn anything from those? Or are there any warnings in those that we need to remember now that things are reopening and we're gonna be back in person for schools? I'm happy to um, take this one. Um, and uh, I, uh, I, I've seen it a lot. Um, and that's something that's very much into the weeds. I'd love to have a, a bigger picture conversation as well. But as far as coping mechanisms and, and what I've seen from, you know, folks spanning from, uh, you know, K-12 to uh, people in higher education is, uh, is social media. Um, and, you know, turning their, uh, their time spent, you know, alone, um, you know, uh, living with their parents or living, uh, you know, uh, in their in their apartments, away from families, uh, to social media, and uh, you know it's been well documented, uh, well discussed that uh, spending too much time in social media uh, will have negative effects on on mental health. It's only made it worse. Uh, so spending time on on Instagram, we saw uh, the explosion of of TikTok. Um, a lot of these platforms, um, you know, lead to uh, further loneliness, uh, peer pressure. Um, and, you know, this feeling that uh, you're, you're somehow missing out on something, even though the world is uh, entirely shut down. Uh, and so, you know, that to me is something that, again, kind of stunned me over the last 12 to 18 months. 
Um, unfortunately, the, there weren't that many, uh, you know, better better solutions, right? Um, and so, uh, doing FaceTiming with your friends, we've seen platforms emerge like, um, and, and I'm forgetting the name of that of that app, but um, sort of a group uh, a group chatting app that a lot of people are using um, to you know have conversations sometimes with strangers, but at the end of the day, um, you know, it's it's all about uh, you know human connection and uh, trying to to stay away and, and moderate how we use social media. And, and to me, that's one of the things I, I wanted to bring up to, to answer that question. Yeah, I think you, you raise a really good point, and that's something that I definitely saw a lot of. Um, I think the other thing. Um, you know, coping, I think kids coped in a variety of ways. In a lot of ways, they tried to replicate what they felt they were missing out on in person. So like the group chats or the meetups, um, you know, I, I saw students rely on that in order to feel that sense of connectedness. Um, I think some people have been successful using some of the apps that were mentioned earlier uh, for kids to check in and share. And I know that there have been positive anecdotes. I don't know if we can say trends yet, of students reporting things or sharing things that they would have otherwise been afraid or less inclined to do in a in-person setting because it's easier to write an email or to talk to someone through a video chat. So I think there've been both positive and negative impacts. Um, but again, I think our students, as they return to school in the fall, well, that's here in Chicago. I know it's different across the country. One of the things I'm most concerned about is how we receive them and how we begin to identify, you know, what their needs are in this new environment. I think we know a lot more than we did 10 or 20 years ago, but I would argue that the last 18 months have been so disruptive. We, as educators working directly with students, we have to be ready to learn quickly and to provide resources and support for students as they come back to school, because I think a lot has changed over this past year and a half. I, I, I would agree with, with uh, Dr. Jackson. I, I only have antidotes and, and they're primarily positive because uh, parents and students were forced to spend time together. They were actually spending time together which was so, so, so positive. Before then, I know the average time, amount of time parents were spending with their children was less than 15 minutes a week. And typically that was just doing disciplinary type stuff. And in our program, we required that parents and students do a weekly meeting of 35 minutes a week. That's a scheduled formal meeting. And so I think the antidote of parents and students being together and spending time together, I think was a positive thing that I witnessed during the pandemic. And, and, and let's face it, the pandemic's not over. <laughs> I just would yeah. add to one here, during this time, we did see some organizations that really stepped up and helped to provide insights and supports that really understood the science of stress. So. In particular, I watched Pure Edge, which is has done incredible work around the country with different leaders, helping them to really understand how to support their educators and their students around the science of stress. In Rhode Island, Pure Edge partnered with our Commissioner of Education, Commissioner Infante Green, and helped to launch supports for students to help to educate them around the science of stress, give, give them short supports that they could use in real time virtually, and then trained educators and had lessons that were done um, in English and in Spanish that really helped to support educators across the state. Those kinds of supports have really mattered a lot and I think are gonna be even more important in this next school year as well. Hey, Art, let me ask, what do you, you know, you obviously focus on, on younger children, I mean, when we talk about mental health, how early should we be thinking about the mental health of kids? Should we be thinking about it before they even enter school, enter kindergarten? Now, the science is pretty clear here. It, uh, it begins like education. Uh, mental health begins at birth. Uh, the, the neuroscientists call it toxic stress. And when the parents are under a lot of stress, that translates, I mean, that baby kind of senses it and it affects brain development. So the best thing we can do, not just in COVID-19, but long-term supporting our parents, 
providing these parent mentors, providing this wraparound service so we reduce the stress in the family. So the mental health of the parent is improved. That improves the mental health of the child. And then as they get into kindergarten, they're more able to cope in different, we know life is gonna throw a lot of uh, hardballs at us, if you will. So if we get that, 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 that foundation right, if we get the mental health right, if we support the parents, and I think the one, I shouldn't say criticism, but one issue that I think we haven't discussed enough is the role of parents when it comes to education and how the public school should be reacting and working with the parents as well as the child. It's not easy, but in the early years, it's, it's, it's critical that we support the parents and we empower the parents. And this is a good example by reducing the toxic stress by providing these wraparound services, as this organization I said, Northside Achievement Zone is doing, we're showing the kind of results where, where mental health is significantly improved both for the parent and we're pretty sure long-term for the child. Nina, when you think about the, the, the role of, of charter schools in this, have you found that they're doing innovative things that, that we ought to be learning from? Um, certainly, and we have some examples that I can share, but I think the one kind of good thing that's come out of all of this, believe it or not, is just the greater awareness about mental health and the need to offer schools more resources in order to make um, psychiatrists and other resources available in the school. And so when you look in the president's budget, um, in the stimulus and also in the budget that was just proposed, there's a lot of funding that's going to uh, go to creating um, kind of communities and schools and other measures to make sure that you have an individual at the school that's coordinating these different services at the school. Um, but I agree with everyone here. I don't think I have anything else to add. I think the one uniqueness about charter schools is that they tend to be smaller. Uh, and because they're schools of choice, they have to cater to the needs of the families who send their kids to these schools. And so in that respect, the needs of the child and making sure the families are happy with what they're getting in that school uh, take precedence over everything else in order for them to keep their doors open. So depending on the situation that they have, they've been able to make a lot of corrections and they have the flexibility to use their money uh, in different ways. They don't have to check in with a centralized bureaucracy uh, for permission. So they have been able to do a lot of different things to bring these resources to the school. Uh, and in that, we have some um, valuable lessons to share, but I don't know if any of them are scalable, so to speak. Yeah, and, and this is where I love to obviously chime in again. Um, I think we're absolutely right in that uh, the pandemic has, uh, you know, for better or for worse, that shed light on the on the issue. I think that uh, if you look at the most recent surveys of um, college presidents around the country, uh, four out of five of them have now made mental health one of their key priorities uh, for their students. Um, and what we've seen over the last um, 15 months uh, talking with a lot of senior administration at universities is that uh, because of the fact that they've had to shut down campuses uh, and because a lot of these campuses are also in remote area, even if you have the funding, hiring providers on campus is simply close to impossible. Um, turning to virtual solutions has gone from uh, something that uh, was seen as maybe too futuristic or maybe too hard to integrate within uh, how care is provided on on campuses to uh, something that's become, uh, you know, uh, mandatory uh, overnight. And, and so turning to these virtual solutions, uh, the silver lining of COVID is that uh, to your point of making it scalable, uh, things like digital therapeutics, coaching, uh, even just telemental health in general uh, have become widely adopted. Um, and uh, we're seeing a tremendous amount of, of interest from, from universities now to think about how do we augment the ability to hire on campus uh, with with digital solutions? So I think this is a great conversation and, and I wanna interrupt for one moment because I, I wanna share another moonshot story with, with everyone. Um, and then we'll come back to this conversation around mental health, but I, I think this might help, help inform what we're talking about. So this is about an organization that's named Erica's Lighthouse. Um, and it's built around a young woman, Erica, who ended her life when she was 14 years old because of depression. And her family, in an attempt to take this tragedy and pain and try and draw on it to help other people, 
They created this organization to empower young people and to educate them about depression and help anyone at risk overcome mental health challenges. And so let me tell you a little bit about Erica and, and we'll watch a quick video and, and the organization. And then, and then I'd love to talk about how we can draw on that example to help students today. I want every kid to live the best life possible given whatever their circumstances. That's what we all want. Um, my daughter, um, Erica, was the third out of three daughters. She was the youngest, she was 14. Um, she loved to write. She was a good writer, she was funny. Um, she struggled with depression. I didn't really know that much about depression at the time, people didn't talk about it. Although she died by suicide, depression is what killed her. And um, after she died, we, we just couldn't believe it. We just, we knew she had depression. We got her a puppy. We got her therapy. She went to a psychiatrist. We did everything we could think of. We took her to the Caribbean. I didn't know really what to do. I thought I was doing everything I could do. So after we lost her, I thought, I remember sitting on the couch with my husband and thinking, she died from this. We thought, oh my gosh, kids, kids need to know this. Her friends were asking and they, and they wanted to do something. So we started Erica's Lighthouse. Now, this is 17 years forward. I mean, I'm going back to the very beginning. I remember thinking, we need to leave the world a better place. We need to find things that would have helped Erica. Um, from the standpoint of U.S. youth and how we're doing with our mental health here, um, on a scale of zero to 10, I would probably put it at a four right now. Um, we're definitely into a warning territory. I was worried about cluster suicides, which is when someone's feeling horrible and they, you know, want out of the pain. They don't think about, hey, uh, I'm never gonna eat pizza again, or I'm not gonna go to prom. They, um, at, they're like in a burning, room or a burning building and they're jumping out the window to get out of the pain. So we need to, instead of having stigma around us and thinking if we talk about it, we need to explain that this is just a stage you're going through. This isn't the entire book. This is just a chapter in the very beginning of your book. And please, please, please be strong, take care of yourself, and there's a lot of things you can do to help your mental health. We are, yeah, in 43 states now, um, 530 schools. We'd like to be in 5,000 schools. It's eight, you were able to do that through the computer. I think if anything is coming out of the pandemic, it is an increase of heightened awareness and need to be talking about mental health, to be educating students about mental health, and being sure that they are getting the support services that they need. But we saw a need that wasn't being filled in the way I thought it should be. And um, so we invented it. I would have loved to have just donated money to somebody else doing a great job on this. It would have been a lot easier and I'd still be dancing. <laughs> if you see the need in your community, you know that the mental health challenges that our youth are facing right now are significant. We wanna work with you, whether you're a program partner, strategic partner, uh, interested in fund some of our efforts, um, we're interested, and you can find out more at ericaslighthouse.org. Obviously, any time that we lose a young person to suicide, it's enormously sad and tragic. And 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 though obviously Erica's Lighthouse is trying to draw on that to 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 share with others what we've learned from it. Let me ask all of you. We are, at this in, we are at this inflection point. People are talking about mental health like they never have before because they've seen the impacts of mental health in their own families, in their own communities. What can we do today, tomorrow, the people who are watching, what do we do right away? Who do we support in order to make sure that there aren't more Erica's going forward now that things are reopening? Um, it's a, it's this a may tough, take the conversation. Oh, in sorry, a, oh, sorry. No, sorry. So you can go because I was Dr. Jackson, about to take it in a different. Yeah. Well, one of the things I, I first of all, a very compelling um, uh, organization and story um, and just really 
amazing to take such, something so tragic and bring it into something so positive. I think when I I agree with Nina that there's more awareness around mental health, um, and I think that's a great thing. We see school districts adopting um, updated policies and different frameworks and providing additional training to support educators to, to address these issues. My one fear and a thing I think people should be paying attention to is the politicizing of mental health. And I know it's not something that you, we really want to talk about, but if people can politicize talking about American history, the good, the bad, and the ugly, they can politicize things uh, related to mental health. And I think that the impact there or the negative outcome we, we know is that we don't address this issue and that we continue to see students reporting issues at a far higher rate than their own parents think they have. That data was, was staggering. Um, I think the other issue is that we don't get the resources that we need in order to address the problem. I know being a former superintendent, one of the things we all often grappled with is like, oh, we want to do more testing. We want to do ACEs on everyone. And then the question would always come after, what happens once we get all of this data? When we find out that the problem is greater than what we even believed it to be, what happens then? And I think that we have to really build on this momentum that people are paying attention to and really advocate for additional resources, uh, psychiatrists, psychologists, more social workers, more individuals to support our students in the schools to identify issues earlier so that they don't um, you know, think that suicide is a way out. And unfortunately, many of our students do feel that way because they don't see you know, light at the end of the tunnel. And we got to get them the resources and a professional support in order to understand that they can overcome the challenges that they're um, dealing with. I, uh, and, uh, yeah, I, I agree with I, I agree with Dr. Jackson wholeheartedly. Uh, often uh, this issue will manifest itself in other communities in other ways. And gun shootings certainly uh, are, I think, indicators of this. But I believe that spirituality is the key to addressing a good portion of the mental health crisis among some students today. Uh, I think that spirituality is a core competence. And uh, once our experience has been once students find it, that they are that they become uh, able to deal with life's challenges. I mean, you don't have to go too far. You can look at current and historic leaders, whether it be Dr. King, Rosa Parks, Dr. Valerie Carter, who is uh, recently uh, uh, is, a, is the owner of the Milwaukee Bucks and the Milwaukee Bucks won the NBA championship or Robert Smith or Dave Stewart. These are all people who command a tremendous uh, competence in spirituality. And so I think it is key uh, for us in sustaining health uh, in route to those students creating a better society for all. Because these people that I just mentioned are all people who dealt with significant challenges and issues. But in spite of that, they leveraged their spiritual competence to deal with life's challenges and did better and did good for the all. I, and I, I you were going to gonna, thank you, Dr. In. Charles, oh, sure, Dr. Jackson. I'm sorry, Ed. I, the, oh, I do want to jump in on this because this is, you know, being an educator for years, also being African American and deeply spiritual, which people who know me best know that I do, and I have these conversations within our family. We know that culturally, when we start talking about mental health, there are challenges in the African-American community where when you have issues, I know growing up, people who had issues, you, you know, we didn't, they weren't, they went undiagnosed and it was like, you know, so-and-so is crazy or go to church or talk to the pastor. And I really just want to make sure that people are listening, understand that this is a health issue. The same way we go get treated for diabetes, we go get treated for cancer, we go get treated for even more mundane medical issues. Mental health is a medical issue and it does sometimes require a medical solution. And I just think, you know, uh, one of the things that was lifted up Dr. Nixon around the gun violence and a lot of the issues that we see right here in Chicago, some of these are mental health challenges and spirituality is definitely going to help. 
but there are also uh, solutions, medical solutions that need to be brought to bear that our students and their families have missed out on for generations. And if we don't start bringing that into the conversation, we're going to continue to see cycles of violence in our families, cycles of uh, just things that are very disruptive and don't lead to the most conducive and, and, and healthy lives for our children. And so I agree, like I said, I'm a deeply spiritual person, but I just don't want to miss the opportunity to talk about this. This is a health, this is a public health issue and we have to address it in that manner, um, in my opinion. Dr. Jackson, I, I just want to follow up. I wholeheartedly agree with you. As a healthcare director of one of the largest healthcare systems in Illinois, uh, I deal with it on a day-by-day -day basis. So I'm not making light of that. But as well, I'm not going to allow a solution that has existed among a people that have brought people where we are today from 400 years ago. You can't ignore that. And so I think that it is a part of it. And I don't think that we can afford to ignore any longer some of the symptoms that we see that mental health is just unraveling around us. So I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. Charles, I just wanted to jump in and agree with uh, Dr. Jackson here. Um, uh, it, it may sound trite because it's been said many times, this really takes a community. This takes a village. You can't just simply put the burden on K through 12. Uh, it is a health issue. It, and the community is so important here in supporting these families and these kids. Uh, again, one of the reasons I wanted to give a shout out to the Northside Achievement Zone, where right now the murder rate is at historic levels. We, we, sent, we, we adopt these families and, and we know it's going to take that kind of support uh, in school and outside of school and supporting those parents and supporting those families. So this really does take a village. And uh, I, I get a little... Uh, nervous when people just point to K through 12 as the solution. Uh, there's a lot on their plate, and this needs a community effort, not simply K through 12. Yeah, and, and the other and thing I'll I say, be... um, yeah, it's it's tough for me because I, I can speak about this for a full 12 hours nonstop. Uh, so I need to really uh, pick and choose my my thoughts on the matter. But um, you know. Uh, uh, first thing I'll say is uh, I, I grew up in a spiritual family. Uh, what what led me to start um, this uh, this company is um, you know one one of my siblings having to uh, drop out of college uh, and being in inpatient care, uh, which was very costly. Uh, she had all the resources that that she needed, um, you know, and uh, um, you know didn't uh, didn't necessarily help. Um, of course, thankfully she she made it, but um, it was a, it was a tough journey. We grew up in, in spirituality, um, and, and while I think it can be part of the, the solution, in this case, it was not. Um, what, uh, what I think led to, um, and this is one story amongst so many others, um, you know, uh, my, my siblings' ability uh, to make it through was trying to think about uh, how do we go beyond just, um, you know, the traditional um, uh, approaches. I think licensed uh, clinicians are, um, you know, an extremely important part of uh, the solution, as uh, Dr. Jackson pointed out. Um, you know, this is a, a medical issue and needs to be solved with, um, you know, medical work, licensed therapists, psychiatrists, and, and medication when appropriate. Uh, but it also takes lifestyle changes. Uh, how do you think about your sleep, your nutrition, <clears throat> exercising, uh, your relationships? Everything matters. And so uh, to me, that's in, in terms of scalable solutions to this problem, thinking about prevention, uh, a lot of suicides can be avoided. Uh, they are sometimes impulsive. They, uh, you know, come from a, a lack of resilience uh, because, you know, we need to train our minds the same way we need to take care of our bodies. Um, and so even before we talk about the clinical population, it's about thinking about resilience and mental wellness um, for everybody not just people that get to that point as we're talking about. So um, to me that, that, you know, those are just the high level thoughts I, I wanted to share, but um, you know, if anyone wants to talk about this, I'll, I'll take my weekends, my evenings, whatever it takes uh, to uh, just spread awareness and, and, and talk about it more. But um, I'm just glad that, um, you know, we're able to um, shed light on the matter in, in such a, an, an important platform. 
Well, let me jump in because we actually have a question from the Aspen Leaders Room from Melanie Huggins, who's from the Richland Library in South Carolina. M Melanie, what did you want to ask and who did you want to ask it of? Yeah, well, ART has really started to address some of this, but it's really for anyone on the panel um, because it's not just the purview of schools and schools can't do um, everything that we need them to do in terms of mental health or education. I'm curious to know from the panel if there are some really fantastic community business or cultural partnerships or even best practice among those partnerships like the Northside Achievement Zone that you'd like to share with us, those of us who are education adjacent like public libraries but don't work in the space. So, you know, I sort of did a shout out to Northside Achievement Zone for the, the, those very reasons, because that's the attempt. And we're trying to track, we're trying to actually measure our results so we can come back with you and say, these just wasn't good intentions. We're basing it on the science. We're basing it on get to the parents at prenatal if we can, and dealing with mom's depression in particular at the very beginning of, of, of birth. Um, and, uh, and I think we're, we are succeeding on a number of metrics. We'll know a lot more in five years, 10 years. We'll get better at this. I think, you know, as a researcher, it's very important to get the feedback, to get the data. We interview our parents. We, 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 we track all this. Uh, and I think it's scalable. Um, but we, we've got a lot to learn. And uh, in, in this, this particular year has been very tough for Minneapolis. And unfortunately, well, fortunately, we were in the right place at the right time. But unfortunately, there's a very difficult times, and I'm hoping to learn a lot more as we move forward. Thank you for that question, Melanie. And 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 so it, I want to take a second to to now um, do another poll because I, as we've been talking about this topic, as we've gotten a chance to understand it a little bit. Um, that brings us to, I wanna understand what you, the audience thinks about this. And and so again, you have 60 seconds to respond and um, you should see the question on Slido or in your Zoom polling window. If, if you were to choose, what's the most important issue in promoting youth mental wellness? We've heard a lot of different perspectives on this. Is it is it the schools need to provide better access to counselors and psychologists? Is it that mental wellness needs to be taught and promoted more within schools in a similar way that, that we teach other subjects? Is it that parents lead, need to learn how to talk about mental wellness with their children? And, and I think this draws in the spirituality issue that Dr. Nixon was discussing. Or is it that we need to teach children how to use technologies in ways that don't cause harm? You know, um, as was mentioned, that, that there's a lot of social media and a lot of negative impacts from that. So let's go ahead and, and take take 60 seconds. Please tell us what you think the answer is. And while you're doing that, I just want to mention a couple of other people who are chiming in, who are joining in from the Aspen Leaders Room. Um, we have uh, Joyce Johnson Miller, who's the chairwoman and chief investment officer of Pacific Gate Co Capital, and um, Robin um, Wabi, who's the executive director of the Missouri Ch Charter Public School Commission. Thanks for joining us, Robin. Um, Rich Harrison is the CEO of Lighthouse Community Public Schools. And Isabel Bibler Parker is a partner at the Wildflower Foundation. These are just a few of the thousands of people who are tuning in right now. But we thought it, it's helpful to, to share with you who else is in this community so that you have a sense of who else is interested and you might be able to reach out to and ask these questions of. And obviously, there's been a, a spirited conversation around how we do address these mental health issues, what, what avenues are available to us and what we ought to prioritize. And so please go ahead and, um, and input your answers to the poll. And um, let's see what the, what the results are, if you guys don't mind bringing those up. I think they're coming. Here we go. So if you'll remember, there were four options here. Wow, this is really interesting. So, so the, the number one answer obviously is, is B, which was the mental wellness needs need, need, need to be taught and promoted more within school, similar to other subjects. I think that this argues for an approach that we, we teach 
mental health the same way that we teach other subjects and that we teach physical health. The, getting to Dr. Jackson's point that it needs to be seen as a as a solvable problem. And that and the number the second thing is that parents need to learn how to talk about mental wellness with their children, which I think ties into a lot of this conversation around the traditional methods of talking about mental health, whether it be parents or whether it be within churches and our spiritual practices, that we really need to emphasize those. So we're getting to the to the end of, of the time that we have, but I want to come back to our speakers one more time and ask you, you know, as we've been reflecting on what's happened over the past year, as we've been reflecting on looking for solutions and, and sharing opportunities and options and perspectives on these different questions, I want to ask your advice on one last thing. And again, this 30 seconds per person to answer this, but it's a way for us to kind of hear your thoughts on, on hopefully what this conversation has added to your perspectives, which is how can we combine solutions to a mental health crisis as, as well as the accessibility issues that we talked about to, to make sure that students are ready for the future? If, if, if I was asking you to forecast what you hope education will look like by 2030, how it'll look different, what are you most hopeful for that within the next nine years, we're gonna be able to accomplish within our schools. Let, let's start with Saul Khan from the Khan Academy. Yeah, I'm a big believer that a lot of times the trends that might be causing issues can also be used to solve the issues. So we know that things like social media are causing anxiety, loneliness, depression, they're at record highs amongst young people. My hope is that Khan Academy and other solutions like it, obviously we can hit the academic component, but with things like schoolhouse.world, we can connect learners to each other, build social connections. And I, I've always said, I'm happy to join the board of any organization that can help with mental health or just frankly make people happier. I think that's the next frontier. That's great. And, and Jenny McGarra from, from Google, what do you think? Absolutely. I think in school, we need to really think about how we're making our students feel safe to bring their full self to school, their entire intersectional identities. A lot of times mental health crises come from feeling isolated and alone, even when you're in a classroom full of people face to face or on a video conference like this with others. When we use technology to help students feel seen and heard and empowered, it helps them feel safer and stronger in their environment. And I hope in the future we're leveraging technology to double click on their humanity and allow them to feel more seen and empowered. Great. Dr. Clarence Nixon um, from T-Lab, how do you feel, what do you hope schools will be different by 2030? By 2030, I hope that the focus on competence uh, and getting parental involvement will have reached a level that will enable uh, our students to be competitive with students all over the world. And that's, that, I think, is what I hope, is that we be able to produce students who are competitive. Fantastic. Fantastic. Julia Rafel Bear. What, 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 from your perspective, is the ambition for, for nine years from now, how education has changed? We need to continue to accelerate how we're reinventing the playbook about support for our kids. We need to be attuned to much more than just the academic needs, but health, safety, food, and housing, better helping students understand the science of stress, continuing to accelerate this reinvention of the relationship between families and schools, and making sure that we continue to reimagine what it looks like at the top of our education systems and make sure that we are working in far more coordinated ways to see impact happen to diversify our systems. Thank you. That's a fantastic, I think you're exactly right. Ed, we've spoken a lot about exactly the topic that you have built a company around. So when you think about both accessibility and mental health, by 2030, how do you hope schools have changed? Yeah, I think there are no signs of the rates of anxiety and depression slowing down uh, in the years to come. Uh, however, there is a shortage of providers in mental health care, and, and that's becoming a burning issue. So my vision is a world where, you know, K-12 school districts and, and higher education institutions receive the financial support they need to provide both on campus and virtual mental health care to make sure students are met wherever they are, whether that's on campus um, or at home. We need to empower public to private partnerships to ensure this world exists and that innovation serves uh, the greater good of, of society in this case. Nina, you've been at the intersection of private partner, partner, private public partnerships for a long time. 
Um, and I imagine that the charter school movement is is getting a, a another breath of, of air from the last 18 months. When you look forward to 2030, how do you hope that education is different? Well, I certainly hope that we leverage everything that we've learned over the past year, the you know, the newfound knowledge and interest that a lot of parents have about education, the appreciation they probably now have more than ever before about the importance of high quality teachers and transcend that into something that can have lasting impact in our public K-12 system. And as I've said before, I think the only way to do that is by making sure that children, especially low-income families, have access to schools outside of their zip codes and the ability to create great public schools where those families live through charter schools. When you give teachers and principals greater agency to run schools as they wish in exchange for raising student achievement, and you combine that with the power of parental options and choice, the recipe is a pretty powerful one. And I think we should leverage that. And if we do that correctly in 2030, hopefully we'll be able to move more of our kids out of poverty and setting them up to really meet and reach the American dream. It are, obviously, a lot of your work deals with kids before they enter the school system. But as you look forward to 2030, whether it be dealing with pre-K kids or dealing with or, or changing the system once they are in a formal education system, how do you think how do you hope things will change? Well, I hope it will change in the following way that the political system who controls the funding recognizes and acknowledges the importance of education starting at birth, indeed prenatal, I would argue. And that sort of a change hopefully would then lead to the kind of funding where we're leaving so many kids behind that we don't have to. So many of these kids would be succeeding today if if we had listened to Obama and, and five, six years ago, or we listened to President Biden today, it's so critical that our kids start school healthy and ready to learn. Education begins early. I want the political system. That's where the power is. They're the ones that can fund th these programs and do it in high quality, especially targeted for all these kids that we continue to leave behind. We've been doing this for years. We know how to fix this. I want an acknowledgement that we can do better. This is the best public investment we can make. You don't want to get me started. We spend a lot of money funding public stadium. I mean, sports stadiums with public money. This is such a better investment. Let's get our priorities right. Mm -hmm. and, and Dr. Jackson, it's particularly apt that we, we finish with you. You know, Chicago has benefited so much from your leadership. And I think we've sort of seen that in this in this conversation that you're you charge headlong into the toughest questions and try and bring innovative perspectives to them. You know, as you look forward and, and nine years from now, where do you hope we are? Yeah, well, I, I took more of an aspirational approach to this, but number and just thought of three wishes. I'm going to change one because. We've heard so many amazing solutions from the panelists. So my first wish is that everything that's already been mentioned happens by 2030. Um, but the other two pieces I would add is number one, that all students have access to, that, that we just raise the standards and the expectations for our students academically. And we provide the support that they need in order to access the curriculum, to access the high standards and all the things that we want for them. And then something that we didn't spend a lot of time talking about today is post-secondary. We didn't crack that nut today in the way that I think we should. And so my third and final would be free college and greater access for all of our students who uh, qualify. Again, building on public and private partnerships, there are amazing groups already doing this work, but in order to scale it, I think Art is right. The government has to step in and we need to see substantial legislative and policy changes at the national level if we really hope to achieve the things that we all want for our children in this country. Absolutely. Well, listen, it, unfortunately we are out of time, but. Thank you so much to all of you for, for your thoughts and for your suggestions and for this fascinating conversation. I just, I feel like I learned so much. And thank you to everyone who's been watching this for, for your thoughts and your suggestions and your questions and for the energy that you bring to these topics. Um, you know, it, I think that one of the things that I carry away from this is that 
there are a lot of problems. We've learned a lot in the last 18 months, but there are a lot of problems that still need our attention and still need our energy, whether it be around um, the access to quality education or youth mental health or, or other issues within your own community. We only make changes by believing that change is possible and by trying to, to share information and ideas and energy around the options and the solutions that are out there. And so I would love to invite all of you to continue to be part of this dialogue by checking our website, moonshotplatform.live, by visiting the Moonshot Impact Gallery. You can go there and you can submit your idea or your project and, and try and find folks who might want to support it. You can nominate other projects and other leaders who you think deserve more attention. But most importantly, I just want to say thank you for, for being a part of this conversation because I know everyone watching and everyone on this panel and everyone who's touched by this conversation will expand it and bring it into their own homes, their own school districts, hopefully to their own leaders. And we'll see those resources and that attention that these topics so desperately deserve. So also, I just want to thank one more time the, the folks who we haven't gotten a chance to meet today, but who made today possible. Yemi A.D., Vit Horky, Alex Braun, Ruben Sagala, Tara Hovey, Pete Cadence, Tavit Henricus, and also to, as I mentioned, our partners, Google for Startups, the Cadence Family Foundation, the Aspen Global Leadership Network, and the Resnick Aspen Action Forum, and JAD Digital Agency. Thank you again to our speakers and our panelists and to all of you. And thank you for creating positive change. You should not hopefully be afraid to aim high, perhaps as high as the moon. And thank you and take care. <laughs>